And Paul actually told them that don't worry, those who are troubling you, they're, they're, that's proof of their destruction. It's proof that while you're having ease, they will be facing the justice of Ionian extermination because they did not hear our gospel. They did not hear the evangel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't talk like that today because we're not suffering today. We go from Dairy Mart to Dairy Mart to another wonderful fellowship where we have wonderful times and we eat good food and we pat each other on the back. In the meantime, Paul being lowered from the Damascus wall in a basket. Why? Because he stood for an evangel. Why did he stand for it? Because he knew it was the difference between Aeonian life and Aeonian death. We have lost that edge because we have made grace to be a slosh bucket that eliminates distinctions between believers and unbelievers, between darkness and light, between truth and lies, between God and Satan. I will tell you this. I mean, I, I should talk about this some. I'm not going to play play dumb on you and just pretend like I didn't know what was going on here. I, the One of the reasons why, I should say the main reason why um, I was asked it was requested of me not to teach on this topic at the following conference, the conference following Willard, was that it was going to make people uncomfortable. Some people were uncomfortable with this message. They didn't like hearing that Ionian life hinged, relatively speaking, on belief, because that was not what they were taught. They were taught something different. They were taught that doctrine was not a matter of fellowship, and certainly it wasn't a matter of Ionian life. Gosh, how could that be, though? I mean, that just, to hear myself saying that, I'm starting to wonder. Doctrine is not a matter of Ionian life, but again, this is the mistake we've made with grace of making it a, a wimpy grace, a weak grace. And I think one of the most startling aspects of this message is that grace turns more people from God than anything ever has. Don't blame grace. It's not grace's fault. It's the human that hates a gracious message. It's the human that is robbed of having to do something to please God. And that is such a startling thing. I ask this question... Um, later, it didn't get on the tape, but what is the one thing God did that turned more people away from the accomplishments of Jesus Christ than anything? What one thing did he bring? What one new thing did he do that turned the most people from a revelation of Jesus Christ? And somebody in the audience got it right. They said, grace. And I said, you got that right. Grace does not mean numbers. In fact, it means the opposite. I was on Second Thessalonians when I left you on the last tape. And let's, let's go back there. I'll start reading that passage again. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Again, I say this is a parallel passage to, to Philippians. We ought to be thanking God concerning you for your endurance, your faith, and all your persecutions. Second Thessalonians 1.5. Um, and the afflictions with which you are bearing, a display of the just judging of God to deem you worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering also. If so be that it is just of God to repay affliction to those afflicting you. That's just what he said to the Philippians, that they, those who were opposing the Philippians, were, that was proof of their destruction, of the, oppo the destruction of the opposers. I'm back in 2 Thessalonians. Listen to this. To repay affliction to those afflicting you and to you who are being afflicted, ease with us at the unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven with his powerful messengers in flaming fire, dealing out vengeance to those who are not acquainted with God and those who are not obeying the evangel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This was Paul's evangel. It's called that elsewhere, the evangel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not only this, this vengeance from heaven is not only dealt out to those who are not acquainted with God, but also, and those who are not obeying. That word simply means to hear and heed, under hear, H-E-A-R, are the elements of the Greek, in the Greek. Those who are not obeying the evangel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall incur the justice of Aeonian extermination from the face of the Lord. Now, to me, there is the proof. 
Eonian extermination from the face of the Lord, those who are not hearing the evangel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This goes, again, this goes along with, with Philippians, that those who are opposing you, don't be startled by them in anything, which is to them a proof of destruction. Okay, strong word there. You, somebody you say, well, that's just a destruction in this life. No, we have a similar situation that Thessalonians are also being persecuted for their belief, and Paul is actually comforting them with the truth that their opposers, their persecutors, will be suffering Aeonian extermination from the face of the Lord. We never talk about this, do we? No, because this is an administration of the grace of God. Have you ever comforted anybody? with the fact that, oh, don't worry, those who are troubling you, they're going to be Ionianly exterminated. No, we don't say that because we're too nice. But Paul didn't hesitate to say it. Why? Do you know why? Because we are not suffering today like the Thessalonians were suffering. These people were being killed, I believe, possibly, being beaten, being persecuted, terrible persecutions because they stood for the gospel. We aren't doing that. And Paul actually told them that, don't worry, those who are troubling you, they're, they're, that's proof of their destruction. It's proof that while you're having ease, they will be facing the justice of Aeonian extermination because they did not hear our gospel. They did not hear the evangel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't talk like that today because we're not suffering today. We go from Dairy Mart to Dairy Mart to another wonderful fellowship where we have wonderful times and we eat good food and we pat each other on the back. In the meantime, Paul being lowered from the Damascus wall in a basket. Why? Because he stood for an evangel. Why did he stand for it? Because he knew it was the difference between Aeonian life and Aeonian death. We have lost that edge because we have made grace to be a slosh bucket that eliminates distinctions between believers and unbelievers, between darkness and light, between truth and lies, between God and Satan. Here comes the 414 right on time. Second Corinthians four three. Second Corinthians four three. Now if our evangel is covered also, it is covered in those who are perishing, in whom the God of this eon blinds the apprehensions of the unbelieving, so that the illumination of the evangel of the glory of Christ, same evangel he's talking about in Thessalonians, same evangel he's talking about in Philippians that the evangel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, does not irradiate them. There's more details on, on this theme, many more details. Uh, I'm working on a report, at least I was. I was working on a report. I got up to page 30 on this. Uh, I want to put this in print so that it can be analyzed and scrut scrutinized and... Uh, any other thing that ends in I-Z-E-D that you want to do with it. Um, I think I'm going to include some, uh, you got some visual things coming up here on, on this tape, things I do on the board that I want you to appreciate. So I'm including a piece of paper, at least this is my intention, uh, with this tape so that you can see that for yourself. Okay? No extra charge. We need to talk about this. We, this, has to, this has to come up. So what if people are uncomfortable with this? Does that mean we can't talk about it? If it's scriptural, we need to talk about it. If, if this is a so-called gray area, then we need to talk about it. And uh, there are others who agree with me, mature people, teachers, who say, yes, this is something we need to discuss. I think it's a vital moment. Okay, you're going back to the conference, and I will talk to you at the end briefly. Thank you. Mainly right down here on the floor between, let's see, my, my first uh, period of meditation was between 12.30 a.m. and 1.30. I laid here on my, in my sleeping bag. You know, I'm always that way at conferences. You, you, you talk, and everybody's really 
putting forth the Word of God and your mind so activated, I can't go to sleep. Richard Condon had the same problem. You just can't shut your mind down. And I, I did a lot of, of thinking. And then God woke me up at 4 a.m. And I continued to think for another hour and a half. You know, that's a wonderful thing about studying Scripture or being a writer or anything. Because we're working when we're looking out the window. That's always my excuse. You know, Marcia sees me looking out the window. Don't you have something to do? I'm working. I'm working. Because every moment of meditation, every moment where we can withdraw in quietness and think is a moment of, of progress. A moment of progress. Um, to bring Jim and Alma and uh, Mike and Shirley up to speed here, last night I was speaking on what I believe to be uh, very, the very deceptive doctrine of free will. And I think there was some misunderstanding about something I was saying, and God gave me a picture that I hope will help clarify what I was talking about. Uh, I said to you that one of the essentials of Paul's gospel is that Christ died for our sins. And I suggested to you, and I think this is true, that the doctrine of free will keeps people from realizing that Christ died for our sins. And I think many here were assuming that there were people who came to a realization that Christ died for their sins, pureness, a pure faith, and then became entangled with free will. I wish the people on the tape could see the chart here, but I have a box labeled died for our sins on top and free will at the bottom. Because what I was telling you last night was that if someone comes to God or attempts to through this doctrine of free will coming up from the bottom here, they will never get here. They will never arrive here because the doctrine of free will, as I said last night, begins with the premise that your sins still remain. So my teaching was that those who are seeking God and who have the doctrine of free will attached initially, right from the bat, to an offering of God, that this salvation, Him dying for your sins, is not an actuality, but it is rather an offer, then I contend still today that free will keeps you from understanding that, and therefore you are an unbeliever, an unbeliever. I know that seems to be a hard and radical saying, but I still say that one who does, has never come, has never come, to understand the death of Christ for their sins, even though they might be in a religious realm, even though they might be going to church, I'm saying that they still have not come to a realization of this vital truth because of this doctrine. And I'm making a big deal of it because I think that we have downplayed the deviousness of it and the harm it has wrought. Now, I think many of you, some of you who were objecting to what I was saying last night, we're already assuming that at one time this person had begun. In other words, they came down from on, on top here, came through a pure realization that Christ died for their sins. They've already been established that. I mean, this is rare. If this happens, it's very rare. Because I say free will is so permeated into the theological realm that most people come by believing they chose Christ. And they never do get to this pure understanding. But I agree with you that if someone comes through that pure understanding, that's saving faith. Yes, that is saving faith. And then if they get entangled in free will, then free will me merely becomes a fog. They, be they do become confused. But you see the big difference, I hope, between coming this way, you touch the essence, God gives you the saving faith, and then you become confused. You're still saved, of course, because once saved, always saved. But isn't that a big difference between coming this way? And I believe most have come to Christ through 
the filter of free will. Free will has become an attachment to the gospel. As Gene had a good, we were talking with this, and Gene said it's like an attachment. It's like something added to something that's true, and it changes the whole tenor of it. It's no longer the pure gospel. It's something added to the gospel. A good analogy, at least an analogy I think might be helpful, is this. If you start pure, like the Galatians, what did Paul say about the Galatians? He said, you began well. What hindered you? They had started well, and Paul was adjusting them. In that case, free will, if they had come to, and it wasn't free will with their case, in their case it was the circumcision and bringing elements of the law into their faith, but then it was a matter of adjustment. Because Paul said they had begun well. And it's, again, it's a rare thing if God can actually speak to you in your heart apart from these, the falseness. That's why I'm zealous to expose this falseness. Because I think it, has, it is keeping a vast number of people from even beginning to see a pure evangel, a pure word of Christ. That it's completely Jesus' work. My analogy w w would be this. If you begin believing that Jesus died for your sin, it's like being given a chunk of gold. It's a chunk of gold. Now, you treasure this in your heart, and Tony has shared this story with us, and I think it's a good one. He's going back to that hill, Tony. That's what reminded me of this. When you were on that hill, I think, before when you first began to be moved about God and the things of God, um, you knew that you were nothing and He was everything. God revealed that to you on that hill, I, I believe, one day. And you were handed a chunk of gold. So let's say someone is handed this chunk of gold, but their friend says, okay, now you have to go to church. So they go to church and they begin to learn of these other doctrines. So that chunk of gold is now spray painted black. It's still a chunk of gold. You still have it. I acknowledge that. And maybe I didn't make that clear yesterday. I acknowledge that a pure faith is, uh, is a simple faith, is a faith given by God. I acknowledge that. And that if, if that if this is the case, if you've come from the top down, then these false doctrines or these bad teachings merely become black spray paint on your gold chunk. Now, what I was telling you last night was that I think m many people, thanks to religion, come from the bottom up. There are a lot of people, well, God is locked up altogether in stubbornness. So our heart is deceitfully wicked. We are a proud people. And free will accommodates that pride. Free will accommodates human pride. It allows the human to be proud while at the same time put a little tin halo over your head. It makes you look like you're good. In this case, you have a black rock that is spray painted gold. That's the difference. If you go from the top to the bottom, you have a chunk of gold that is spray painted black. If you're going from the bottom to the top, you have a black rock that is spray painted gold. In one case, you really do rely on Christ totally for your salvation, but you merely think you believe in free will. That's the goal. In the other case, you really do believe in free will. It satisfies your pride, but you think you're trusting Christ. And you say, boy, what a mess then. People are going, coming and going, how do we know? How do we know? Are we supposed to know? Is it our business to know who is who? You know, it is, and there's a way to find out. This is what you do. You rub. You rub. And when you take the gentleman who has the gold that has been spray painted black, and you rub, and you expose that doctrine that has tainted him, he will suddenly... Realize it may have been years before since he knew he had a gold nugget, but you expose it and something moves in his heart and you start to rub and something starts to glow beneath the paint and he says, yes, that's where I started. I remember now. And you bring a remembrance to him. 
However, when you rub, you're doing the same action with this other fellow who's coming up from the bottom, whose stone is actually who actually is holding a black rock that's sprayed gold. When you rub that, what is happening? An entirely different reaction is taking place. You are showing him that what he thought was a reliance on Christ was in fact and in reality and in essence a reliance on himself. One of two things will happen. He will either fall on his knees and come to a realization that for the first time in his life he has been introduced to Jesus Christ. I've heard this happen. I've heard of pastors being in the pulpit for 20 years and they testify that they were saved yesterday because it was that long before they had a true realization. They themselves recognized that they had been holding a black rock that had only been spray painted gold. And with the rubbing, it comes to be shown what it is. There's another reaction and that is hatred. Hatred that of, the, of being exposed. Hatred of seeing that, oh my God, I've been holding this dirty rock all my life and I thought it was the real thing. And now this man is telling me that it's all for naught. It's all nothing. And there's an anger at that point. And there's a rebellion. And there's a hatred toward the messenger. And that is evidence. That is evidence that his heart lies at the bottom and not the top. That to me is evidence that he has not come from the top to the bottom. He has come from the bottom to the top. And a good example are the people who are alive in the days of Jesus Christ. There were two classes of people. There were the religious people and there were the, the publicans and the sinners. And uh, Jesus came and he rubbed. A good evangelist will rub. And Jesus rubbed, and the people who had a heart for God, the people who had a heart for God were shocked to hear that their leaders were hypocrites and vipers. But they realized that as He rubbed, they were seeing a sparkling thing of great value. The Pharisees, the same rubbing. It was the same rubbing. What did they see? They saw that they were actually worshipers of Satan. They hated him. They, they denied it. They were in denial and they hated the messenger that told them that. But the chips will fall. The chips will fall. You know, we have some wild cats that come to our uh, farm once in a while. We have cats that we love and that live there and they wander around. Sometimes wild cats get in too and sometimes they're all eating at a common bowl. Do you know how to tell what, who the wild cats are from our cats? Go out there and say, Hey! And the wild cats take off. But the ones we know, the ones that know our voice, they look at hey, there's that idiot owner again. There's that guy. If you want to find out where people lay, just set off a bomb in the near vicinity. That's what Jesus did. Jesus set off a bomb in the vicinity. And suddenly it polarized people. Either you hated it or you loved it. That's my message. I'm trying to get through the gray. I'm trying to cut through the gray because Paul tells us what part has a believer with an unbeliever. Paul says do not be yoked with unbelievers. But Paul, how can I tell who's an unbeliever and a believer? Well, Paul says I got a good way to tell. What I do is go into the synagogues and I preach the truth. When they throw rocks at me, I figure they're unbelievers. That's easy. It's not that hard. This isn't a science. Paul was on Athens on Mars Hill and he was speaking to the Athenians and uh, after he gave his testimony, it says, some of them jeered. Boo! Get out of here! Others said, eh, we'll, we'll talk to you next week about this. Stop back. Others followed Paul and said, we believe what you're talking about. Uh, th this is not rocket science. Paul could determine from this that I bet you the people who jeered are not believers. Uh, I'm not sure about those who put me off. They might be, they might not be. I'm not going to make any hasty decisions about them. 
But these people that have come to me, I have fellowship with them. And Paul testifies, this same Paul testifies in another place in Philippians 1.29. He says that those who oppose you, it is proof of their own destruction and of your salvation. Those who oppose you. The rubbing, the opposition, that's where the chips start to fall. We don't know who's come from the top, who's come from the bottom. It's not maybe our job to find out. But again, it doesn't have to be your job to find out when it hits you over, over the head. I had to ask myself as I was lying on the floor here trying to sleep last night, why did I embark on this study in the first place? Why am I looking for these distinctions? Why am I trying to find who is a believer and who is an unbeliever? Um, basically, I want to keep things, di things distinct during this eon. I want to be sure that we have a pure message and I want to get rid of any taint. So I, I, I rub and I put out the word. Uh, I was listening, I think this is the catalyst that drove me to this, to thinking this way. But who are unbelievers? And are they disguised as believers? And a lot of them are. I listened to a tape six months ago by Jim Coram on free will. And Jim Coram said something that was more shocking than I had ever said. Now, this, this impressed me. I thought I had said some shocking things in my day. I suppose in my soulish side, I, I like that. I take pride in that, that I say shocking things. But this was nothing compared to what Jim Coram said on this tape. He said, and it, it stunned me, that free will is humanism disguised. I've been six months... I have been six months following that to its conclusion. That stunned me. Because we will all admit that humanists are not members of the body of Christ. They strive for the human. They establish, they're establishing their own righteousness. They have no need for God. And yet Jim Corn was telling me that free will, which is a major tenet of the Christian religion is humanism. And I have this thing that I have to follow these things out to their logical conclusion. I'm, I just can't rest with hearing that. I have to follow. What does this mean? What does this portend for us today? What does this have to do with who we fellowship with? With uh, the doctrines we expose and the doctrines we embrace? It means that most of Christians are humanists in godly garb. Humanists. Now it takes the discernment of the Spirit to recognize the difference. Alright, my pen's drying out. Anybody got a... Alright, watch. watch. Watch what I'm doing here. I'll do the best I can with this pen that's failing me. Which line is longer, the top line or the bottom line? Again, you folks at the tape, on the tape can't see this, but I have two lines and I have like uh, sideways V's coming out of each. One, they're going outward. The V's are going outward on the ends. The other, they're pointed inward. Well, you may have seen this optical illusion. But in fact, both lines are of equal length. But the amazing thing about it is, this one certainly appears to be longer, the one on top, because we're associating it with lines on the end that are elongated, that are taking our eyes outward. And on the bottom, we're deceived in our vision by seeing lines going inward. Therefore, because this line is nestled within four lines that are drawing our eyes inward, we think this line is shorter. But in fact, the lines are of equal length. The lesson from this is that both are humanists, both believe in man, 
both rely on humanity for salvation, but one of these is obviously evil. Saddam Hussein is a humanist. Saddam Hussein is a humanist because he doesn't know the evangel of the glory of Christ. And he's surrounded by evilness and wickedness, and so we see, well, that's obviously wrong. But now, if you take Saddam Hussein, you take the same unbelief, the same humanism, you take Saddam Hussein, bring him into a church, put a suit and tie on him, put him with people who are praising the name of God, put him with, in a place where they're singing hymns, and give him the right words to say, and put a fish on his car, And if you're not paying attention, you're going to think he's a believer. But guess what? He's not. This is a deception, and it takes real spiritual discernment to see it. Paul had that discernment. And he knew that there were wolves among the sheep, and he pushed, 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 pushed for separation between what was right and what was wrong. Between what was true about God and what was false about God. Between what was the evangel and what was not the evangel. And Paul had spiritual vision like x-ray. He was not deceived by these outward appearances. He did not see people just because they were hanging around the Corinthians, that they were among the Corinthians, that they were with His message. He knew that they were antagonists to His message. And he very flatly and straightforwardly says, I want you to shun those who have a form of devoutness yet deny the power. Um, I would like to mention one other thing. Dean made a point last night at the close of my talk. Um, I shared with you the tract, Salvation Plain and Simple, and I, I told how the man in the tract is very tricky. He says, there's, you know, there's nothing we can do to be saved, but you must trust in Jesus. And I was saying, well, you must not do what this man said. So Dean said, well, you're saying the same thing as he is. You're saying you must not do what he's doing. He's saying you must not do this. And you're, it seems, putting a, a, another stipulation on that you must not believe what this man is saying. Uh, and I, boy, I had to think about that one. No wonder I couldn't get to sleep, huh? And uh, I see what Dean's saying, and I think the answer is this, that in Scripture we do have exhortations. In fact, uh, I'm, I'm, you don't have to turn here, but in, in Acts uh, chapter 4, verse 12, Peter says that there is no salvation in any other name, for neither is there any other name given under heaven among men in which we must be saved. We must be saved by the name of Jesus Christ. Does that become an imperative? Does that become a law? The difference between what the man in the tract was saying, his must, you must do this in order to be saved, the difference between that and my must, uh, you must not believe what this man says, is that he is looking at it in the fact that you are the absolute. You are the one who must do it, apart from any help from God. That's his perspective. Now my perspective is, by the grace of God, you must not believe this man's word. By the grace of God, you must not adhere to this false teaching, else you will have no awareness of a vital element of, of saving faith. I'm seeing it that it's an imperative to believe the truth. I, I, I think it is. And boy, Paul asked me a tough question the other day. We were having a little scripture talk, the family and I, three days ago. And he says, and I said, boys, you know, it is good to call on the name of the Lord. Because we talk about this a lot. And um, I always tell them that it's all God, it's all God, it's all God. And, but, and then I'm, I'm telling them, well, you... I do want you to call on the Lord. I do want you to talk to Him. And Paul asked me, leave it to a, leave it to a seven-year-old to stump you. Dad, do we, do we have to call on the Lord? Uh, well, uh, and, and Marshall looked at me like, well, Mr. Genius? Paul turned my face red. Um, well, you do, but you don't. How's that, Paul? Does that make sense? Um, yes, we do. We must.
call on the only name under heaven by which we are saved. And yet, the vital difference, the vital thing that is in our brain is that we are doing this out of God. It is out of God working through us that is giving us the necessary confession into the necessary belief that leads to Aeonian life. And the opposite of that is, I must do it because God's leaving me to my own will. That's the big difference, see? So, we're using the same words. We're using the word must. We're using the word have to. We're using the word necessary. And people get nervous when they hear those words mixed with Paul's Gospel. There's, a, there's another place in, in Galatians uh, 4.12 where, where Paul says, Become as I am. For I am even as you, brethren. I beseech you. I beseech you. He wanted to become as he was in his reliance on, on, on Christ alone. This is the Galatian problem. Beseech. That's the same word translated must in about a hundred other places. I must you. You must imitate me. People get nervous with these musts. And I do too. And we have to really think about this. There are exhortations. And I exhorted you last night not to be deceived. Because deceived people aren't saved. Relatively. It's all in the relative plane. I hope that helps a little on that. This might be helpful too. I was talking with uh, whose tape's that? Okay. Hello. Okay, there it is. I was talking with uh, Richard Condon, and we were talking about another critical element of the evangel, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Obviously, foundational. Richard and I were talking, I said, Richard, Rich, what if a person came in today with a t-shirt that says, Jesus is dead? What would we think? Are they saved? Are they part of our fellowship? Uh, has God given them belief for Aeonian life? I think that's one of those rocks that hits you in the head. I would say no. And Richard said no because, well, it's obvious because that's the opposite of believing that he rose. The opposite of believing he rose is believing he's dead. So that doesn't belong to this path that leads to Aeonian life, does it? But the thing is, with this Jesus dying for our sins versus free will, it's a little harder to see it but it's just as obvious. I mean, it's just as opposite. It's just as opposite. Believing in yourself for salvation is just as opposite of Jesus dying for your sins as Jesus being dead is to Jesus being roused. It's just as opposite. And if somebody came in the door and says, Jesus is dead, we'd say, Brother, you know, we'll talk to you and everything, but, you know, you're not of our faith. I mean, we, we love you and we have some drinks back here if you're thirsty, but um, you know, we think your doctrines will infect our fellowship. That's what Paul would do. But yet, if a person came in with a t-shirt that says, I believe in free will, well, that's, well, we don't think that's as bad. See? That's not quite as obvious. But to me, what he's saying is, I believe I'm a humanist. He might as well, to me, to my vision, he has a t-shirt that says, I am a humanist. He's not a secular humanist, he's a Christian humanist. But the line is the same length, you see. The line is the same length. And Mr. Nock wrote a paragraph here at the beginning of his article called, Who Will Be Snatched Away? And I, I'd like to read this first paragraph because this touches exactly on what we're speaking of. These things of consequence. And again, I bring you back to a remembrance of why I am telling you this. Because I want you to be aware of the, the killer virus that these false teachings are, like free will. And I also want you to be aware how important it is to discern that which is of God and that which is not. No matter if it's just in sheep's clothing or not. 
I've always been a stickler for this. You know, I, I know there's people who embrace the truth and they still go to church. And, okay, you know, it's a free country. You can do what you want. But when they ask me what I think, now that's a different story. That's like taking your finger out of a dike, asking me what I think. What I think is that evil conversation corrupts kind characters. When I joined the Postal Service, I was a good boy, okay? I wasn't the rat thing that I am today. And I went into the post office, and there's some rough dudes working there. Rough dudes. But I was a good boy, and I, I was going to go in there and be the godly influence in the post office and change them all to Christ. Well, guess what? I came out of the post office using so many four-letter words as a general part of my day that um, I ended up fitting right in with them. Well, what a surprise. Didn't Paul say that would happen? When you put the good apple into the rotten bunch, the, the good apple doesn't turn the rotten bunch all into good apples. In fact, the rotten apples corrupt the good apple. Paul was aware of this. That's why he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, what fellowship does darkness have with light? Don't be yoked with unbelievers. But Paul, I, don't, I can't tell who's an unbeliever or not. Well, wait for us to see if they throw rocks. Here's, set a bomb in the vicinity. Tell them the truth. Then you'll find out who are believers and unbelievers. Tell them the truth. Tell them the truth. You know, so a lot of people, okay, a lot of people say, I love the truth. Well, I'm getting on so many different trains. A lot of people will say, well, I love the truth. I love the truth. James Huff, do you have a sister? you have a sister? Three, Three sisters? Okay. I tell James Huff, James, I, I just love your sisters. I, I, I love your sisters. I, I really do. But then James' sisters come over to my house. And I open the door and say, what are you people doing here? Get out of here. We're James Huff's sisters. I know. I don't want you in my house. Get away. Get out of here. Actions speak louder than words. Which is based on a scriptural verse. Namely, Paul says, there are many who are avowing an acquaintance with God who deny that acquaintance by their acts. I think that's in Titus. Maybe not. Read the whole New Testament, you'll find it. <laughs> there are many who profess an acquaintance with God that don't have it. Likewise, there are many who say, we love truth, we love truth. And I believe, personally, that there are going to be many people at the great white throne. The great white throne, now, not the dais, the great white throne, who will say, but God, we loved the truth. And God who examines the hearts, We'll say, roll the tape. Of course, not really, but I'm putting this in as an example. And they will see those times in their lives where the truth came. The truth came in the form of you, or you, or you, sharing it. And it was rejected. It was opposed. It was hated. Actions speak louder than words. And Paul a couple places in Scripture that I won't get into, a couple places in Scripture, Paul said that their opposition of you is proof of their destruction. Again, that's the rubbing that exposes what you're holding in your hand. Okay? That's the rubbing, the opposition, the bomb, the truth, the hey. It'll shake them loose every time and they'll start to polarize. And then you'll see who are believers and unbelievers. It's important to know because, again, as going back to my analogy from the post office, it infects you. And that's why I warn people who continue to go to an Orthodox assembly that it's not a good thing. It's a good thing to fellowship, but why don't you join the Elks Club or something? You know, why don't you, go, why don't you join a bowling league with some people? Then you're not being infected by this false teaching. And I do say infected. Paul compared one teaching to gangrene. Remember Hymenaeus and, and uh, Philetus who swerved as to the truth? Paul says their word will spread like gangrene. Okay? And uh, Paul said that those of the circumcision should be gagged. That's hard. This, uh, the Apostle of Grace said this. They ought to be gagged because they are subverting whole households. You know, the Galatians started to go bad, and I don't think it took many circumcisionists to do it. It might have only taken one. 
It might have only taken one troublemaker to drop a little hint to the Galatian church. Saved by total grace? Well, you know, you got to add this. All it took. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I know that's in the circumcision, but it comes through in Paul's gospel with Paul's care in distinguishing things that differ. So I counsel people and I say, don't, don't listen. And it, listen to this. A, a brother recently told me, he really didn't believe what I was telling him. He continued to go to church and things and continued to hear evil tidings evil conversations, lies about God, and he said, it began to affect me. I began to lose my peace. It was happening very slowly. I thought I could withstand it. See, we're, we're not playing games. We're not playing games with the sovereignties and authorities and world mights of this present darkness. We think we can play games. We think we can go in and it doesn't really matter if these false teachings are around. We're bigger than that. We're not. We are not. And I told you last night how powerful the adversary is and how deceptive and how alluring, alluring the Galatians who bewitched you, bewitched. That's very strong. They were mesmerized, just like Satan mesmerized Eve. The question is, does it happen from the top down or from the bottom up? That's the big difference. If it happens from the bottom up, I'm sorry, but it's keeping them from salvation. If it happens from the top down, it's not. It's something that needs to be adjusted. But if it happens from the bottom up, as is the case in many cases, I think in the majority, then we need to come down hard. Hard on the false teachings. Not the people, the teachings. And the brother testified. And I think, Tony, I think you had an experience like this on the internet. Didn't it wear you down after a while? To be constantly in the barrage of wanting to testify to the truth. And yet the opposition comes. And the opposition comes. And you start to answer everything. And you start to, you want to defend the faith. But after a while, you're, it's like you banged your head against the wall. And I think you got physically sick for a while, didn't you, Tony? There comes a time for separation. This is why I disagree with Mr. Nock when he says that doctrine should not be a basis for fellowship. In fact, that was the title of my talk, and I'm about done with my time, and I haven't started my talk. My talk was on doctrine. Should, it is a basis for fellowship, and I have evidence of that with Paul. Um, I'm not sure what time I started, but I know it's getting close to lunch. That was the beginning of my talk. I haven't gotten there yet, but I'm not going to subject you to that now. But I disagree with them. I have, and again, Mr. Nock, I love the man. I owe him so much for my understanding to him, and yet I think that as every one of us have our chinks in the armor, every one of us, Myself included, everybody here, Mr. Nock had a chink in his armor. And I think it had to do with his treatment at the hands of the Plymouth Brethren. Mr. Nock was put out of the Plymouth Brethren because he fellowshiped with other people and because he learned the truth. And it hurts to be told by your friends that you are no longer welcome. And I think that affected Mr. Nock profoundly in the sense that I think he went overboard now in, uh, in accepting, you know, myriad false doctrines. But he's still a brother, even though he might believe Jesus is dead. That sounds extreme to you, but even though a guy thinks Jesus is dead, you know, we, he's still got that fish on his car, so we're going to accept him as a brother. He's got a fish on his car. So, but I think we need to be more discerning than that. I don't know how, much, how many, I don't know what, I don't know if I'm going to get to speak to you again. I don't know what the schedule is. I, I have other things to say. Um, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I, 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 I want to also talk about grace as related to this. God's message is still one of grace. I just want to whet your appetite for two and a half minutes, then I'm going to close. This is still an evangel of grace. We are saved by grace. But, isn't it strange that that doesn't guarantee that people will hear the message? I think we have thought that because we live in an administration of grace, and because God's message is one of grace, then a lot of people 
our understanding and coming into this message. I disagree. I don't think grace necessarily equals numbers. I think that the message is gracious. I think grace is the nature of, the, of Paul's evangel. This is the most gracious, gracious news God has ever sent earthward. But the strange thing about it is, the more gracious it is, the more it repels humans. Did you know that the law was never called a snare? Isn't this interesting? This dawned on me one day. I was driving down. I was driving with Charlie Cronk, and we were talking about these things. And I said, Charlie, the gospel of the circumcision, the law of Moses, was never called a snare. Why? He said, well, because it was right out there. God says, you do this for me, I'll do this for you. You don't do this for me, I won't do this for you. The human understands this, and a lot of people try to do it. The human likes this. So you're looking at a lot of people. However, in Paul's message, God has done it all. It's a snare. Every new thing, and that's the theme of, of, of the conference this year, every new thing God does separates more people. That is a hard truth. Every new thing He does, He cuts more people out. I'm sorry. But I'm not sorry. It's God's work. Who separates? God does. That's just what's your appetite. I don't know if I'm going to get to talk about this. I don't know what the future holds, the next minute holds, or especially not the next few hours. But I just want to say that I've been privileged to again to come here again. Seven years now, Marsha and I have been coming here, growing, learning, uh, meeting all of you. It's been an incredible uh, time these past seven years. Every face I look at, I love. And um, God is good. I appreciate your patience with me over the years. I know I'm rambunctious. And I, I know I, I, I'm zealous and I get carried away, but I, I pray that as I walk and as, you, as God continually adjusts me through you, that my zeal would become more and more in line with recognition. That's my prayer for myself. That I come to realize more and more that recognition will join my zeal and that God could do a pure work through my broken vessel. No consent for the death, yet consent required for the salvation, for the grace, for the life? No. We are condemned and redeemed without our consent. Then what is belief, you may ask? Why do we believe then? Before we can believe anything, there has to be something to believe. I'm giving you a gospel that salvation comes apart from you and it is it comes by the work of one man, Jesus Christ, who undid the work of Adam. Now there's something to believe. You might believe it and you might not. Even if you don't believe it, it still applies to you and you will spend eternity with God because of what Jesus Christ did. And when you finally get there, at the consummation of the eons, eventually, then you'll agree with it, then you'll like it. But you don't have to like it before that because it doesn't care whether you like it or not. Just like Adam doesn't care if you like it or not. You're born a condemned sinner. Jesus Christ doesn't care if you like it or not. You're saved because of him before you were even born. Then what is belief? Belief is coming to understand what I'm telling you. And when you do that, then you have a special life come into you called in the scripture, Aeonian life. What it means is that you don't have to wait until the consummation of the eons when God reconciles all things to himself through the cross of Christ, Colossians 1.20. You don't have to wait for that. Some people are going to have to wait for it. It's going to be a long time. They're still redeemed apart from their consent at the end. But the message that I'd like you to believe is that salvation comes through a righteous act of one man apart from your consent or your contribution. When you believe that, then the Spirit 
enters you in a larger way, in a greater amount. And only Christ can cause you to believe it. This is where predestination comes in, isn't it? If you believe what I'm telling you, thank God, you will come in to that life in Christ early. Others will have to wait. I want you to come in early. I want you to believe the truth. And the truth is this, and I'll close with this. The act of one man, Adam, condemned the entire human race without its consent. The act of another man, called the last Adam. This one redeems the same humanity that was condemned in Adam. Every single one of them apart from their consent. And if he doesn't do that, then he is lesser than Adam, not greater than Adam. But he is greater than Adam. And the least he's going to do is redeem the entire race. But since grace is greater than sin, he is going to do much more even than that.